Hey, everybody, this is uh, PSU Foreman, your prop Mike Foreman here, COM 170 cast. Thanks for watching. We're here with Tyler Feldman. Tyler, uh, you're going to be eventually watched uh, by 103 students. We're going to wow. give. Wow. I mean, when you get those kinds of views, who knows what can happen? <laughs> well, we promise to keep it to 30 minutes. Uh, let's begin with your name, your job title, and your Penn State educational credentials. What a fantastic introduction, PSU Poorman. So they don't even call you Mike? They don't even call you Mike Poorman, it's just PSU Poorman? No, they call me Mike, they call me Professor Poorman. Sometimes uh, they'll call after hours. Do they ever call you just the man? Uh, only, only when it's a bonus question. Okay. So All back right. to you, Tyler Feldman. Okay. Best 31 minutes of your life now, because I had to do that quick intro on my end. Uh, my name's Tyler Feldman. That's T as in Tuesday, Y-L-E-R, F as in Friday, E-L-D-M-A-N, in case you need to spell my name correctly. Uh, happy to be here with PSU Poorman. Great guy. Graduated in spring of 2016, which it seems like forever ago now. Obviously, age is PSU Poorman's quite a bit which I'm sure is fine in his book. And currently I am a sports anchor reporter at WITN TV, the NBC affiliate in Greenville, North Carolina. There's also Greenville, South Carolina. So just to make that confusion, not a confusion. Well, you had a, how'd, I there? how'd I do there? How'd I do there with that intro? Nice job. You did, you have a, you had a double major at, at Penn state. What were your intentions um, at Penn state? Where did you, want to end up and I think this is part of your career path this is where you want to en end up right yeah so actually my senior year of high school I'm from Pittsburgh originally I applied to multiple schools within Penn State like I applied to the engineering school the liberal arts school went undecided and got into all those schools but then figured out that I didn't want to do any of those paths so I ended up just applying to SMEAL the College of Business at Penn State got into SMEAL was taking business classes, but through a mutual friend in high school, I met a guy named Mike Essie, who's currently a big time producer extraordinaire at ESPN. But I was introduced to him through that friend and he showed me Calm Radio my freshman year and I was just totally hooked. So early on in my freshman year, despite not being a communications major, I was pretty dead set on trying to become a double major in both business and broadcasting. And I made it happen. Are you, your, your finance or actuarial sciences, which one was it? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not that smart. So I was initially finance. And then I realized that my focus was so much on the sports broadcasting side of things that I switched from finance to marketing just because the classes were a little bit easier to digest when you're focused on stuff outside of the finance world. Okay, so you, you had a, we're gonna, cause we've heard a lot from Com Radio. You had a great career at Com Radio. You graduated from Penn State. Your first job, how did you get it? How long did it take? And where was it at? My first job was in Binghamton, New York. They have a wonderful Wegmans. And that's pretty much the highlight of Binghamton. I'm not knocking the area, but it's, it's a small town in the Southern tier of upstate New York. And I got that job, well, I was first told of the job by a Penn Stater February of my senior year. So there was a Penn Stater who was also in Com Radio, two Penn Staters actually in Com Radio, working at this station, WBNG-TV, the CBS affiliate in Binghamton, New York. And they had reached out to me telling me that there would be a couple jobs open come the springtime. So I'd applied first to a news job didn't want the news job and then a sports job opened. And so through those two Penn State connections, they were aware of my dreams and aspirations and my abilities and went to bat for me. And I think that's a big reason why I got that first job. That's a Penn State. I like that. WBNG. I think that's that's short for what's that short for? Bingham? It, it's short for PSU Poorman. Doesn't quite know how to operate Zoom. God. We had a little technical difficulty folks, before we got on. I forgot to turn on the sound. Um, so what did you do in that job? You're a sports guy. What did that entail? 
Yeah, weekend sports anchor and reporter. And so what that means is Saturday and Sunday, I'd be the sports anchor. We had a six o'clock newscast, an 11 o'clock newscast. And then we would also have a 10 o'clock newscast on the CW. And so I would anchor six shows every week for the most part, occasionally wow. filling in on a Monday or, or Friday. And then during the week, I would report three days a week. So whether that's covering the Binghamton Rumble Ponies. And so when I was there, Tim Tebow was with the Rumble Ponies because they're a Mets affiliate. That. You were buddies with, were you buddies with Tebow? Tell us a good Tyler Tebow story. You guys friends, I've seen your interviews. So, so Tim's a great guy. I mean, he may get knocked on for all the wrong reasons, but in general, in general, Tim understands the media profession because he's been around it for so long. He works in it. And he's just genuinely a very nice guy. So my whole thing as a reporter was what angle could I use differently? Because national media would come and get your prototypical soundbite from Tim. What's it like playing in the minor leagues? What are those experiences like? So at that time, Tim is now married, I believe. I don't keep tabs on Tim, but I think he's now married, at least engaged. So the questions that I would ask would be involving his love life. So I feel like I made a memorable time of covering Tebow by asking silly questions about if he had found any love in Binghamton, because in my experiences, when you're stuck in Binghamton, finding that that thing outside of baseball or outside of your work was, was second fiddle to your actual job. Well, as I shared with you and, and, and you guys watching this, you know, you need to have uh, three takeaways and a, and a big takeaway. So I, I think this is a, a neat takeaway is find a different angle, treat someone like a person, establish a relationship. That's your deal with Tebow. Did he call you Tyler? Did he call you Felds? Did you guys go to Wegman <laughs> by Hoagie? You know, Not Felds. And I, he may have called me by name a couple of times, but when he heard my voice, you would always see an initial grin because he knew that something that wasn't your ordinary question was coming. So that so, was your that was your brand, and you probably got you got better stuff. Do you can is that something uh, that you you've learned there, or that you continue to do now that you're in North Carolina, not South Carolina? I I think it's it's more your personality because I think a lot of times in the industry in journalism you'll find people that avoid attempting to build relationships just to get the soundbite that they need. And you can usually tell when someone's just strictly doing it for themselves. But a lot of times when you go into these interview situations, you got to put yourself in the athlete or the coach's shoes and say, you know, what are they getting out of this? Why, why should Tim Tebow answer my question? So what I've learned is you really need to develop relationships. And however that is, you may do it. Everyone has a different persona. I always say, well, stay true to yourself. There. How, do, how, do you, how do you develop that relationship? You know, there's 12 people with a microphone. And I, I, I need to add this. Um, you can make this answer fairly short. But like you have a somewhat, your, your sense of humor is, <laughs> is a little bizarre and a little bit of a desired taste. But having said that, <laughs> Uh, as a guy, die, guy who's really a big fan of dad humor, uh, I get, I get your humor. Well, I mean, that's those are your words. Now, I, now other people have just said I'm flat out hilarious, but I mean, you can be tougher on me because you're you're basically in the dark right now. I don't know if the sun's behind you or in front of you. You look like the ghost of Mike Porman. Well, this is it's this is all about this is all about you. No, this is it's. Uh, no, I think, I think it's, that's a good question. A, a lot of people ask me that and at the end of the day, and that's, that's such a crutch. Everyone says at the end of the day, um, you just got to be yourself. I don't take myself too seriously and I like meeting people and I, I like being a pain in the neck. I, I like being slightly annoying. And so it is maybe a, a taste to get used to my humor but I also think it makes me somewhat likable and approachable. How does that, no, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think that's a really interesting point. How does that translate uh, to the viewers on the screen? You know, that's your, your personality, whether it's in Binghamton or now in Greenville, uh, people know you. I love the story of speaking <laughs> to Wegmans Binghamton, the woman who made you hoagies. 
uh, was a big, big fan of yours. So did yeah, she, she was really also a big Seahawks fan. So you never know where people, if you're, if you're a writer or if you're on the internet in some capacity with a podcast or a blog or a radio show, who may be listening and why they may be listening. So you'd be surprised to find out that if you're in one of these smaller markets, you can really carve a path and become noticeable. And I think a lot of times it comes down to how confident you can be with who you are. Because when you're on, when you're on local TV, when you're on TV in general, you can tell the person when a person is comfortable in their own skin and confident, whether or not they believe in themselves or not. And you can certainly tell when someone doesn't necessarily trust what's coming out of their own mouth. So a lot of times when it comes to connecting with viewers through a TV, you have to be able to have some authority in your voice, some warmth in your stature and some energy. Like there needs to be a combination of those three things just to be able to connect because you're connecting from a distance, which during a pandemic is great. Like I'd rather talk to someone, especially Poorman, because like for his sense, who knows if he put on deodorant or brushed his teeth today. Like I don't have to smell him. Like no one has to smell me on TV. So the key okay. is how can you have a little energy and sports allows the energy to come out. News anchoring, that's a little bit different where you need to be pretty serious about the situation. I've done the news anchoring thing. And for my personality though, it's, it just fits with sports. Hey, uh, I, I just want to talk to the, you guys here watching this. Uh, your three, your three points are really good. That's a great takeaway. That's good advice. You could have actually stopped there. That's a great soundbite. So multiple part question. Uh, how did you get from big, not, and I know the answer is in the car, but how did you get from big <laughs> to Greenville? And then what's your next step? And then for that career path, I know that there's X number uh, of kids in class watching this who want to be a sports broadcaster. So your path to Greenville, where do you go next? And what your career path, what's your takeaway to telling people who actually want to do what you want to do? Wow, you are, you are the question asker extraordinaire. And see, that's another point. Pander, pander to the person. Make them feel good about their question, even if it was a terrible question, which we all know Poorman's had his fair share. Multiple part question. Thanks for avoiding it, but let's get to it. Okay, Green yes. From, from Binghamton to Greenville, I spent two years, three months in Binghamton. Then the person who I, I replaced in Greenville graduated from Penn State two years prior to me. Alex his name, Walker. His name's Alex Walker. So I always tell people, I don't know how talented or gifted I am at TV, but I can sure as heck build relationships and friendships. And Alex is a lifelong friend. I mean, Poorman's a lifelong friend. And that's not even his real name, though. Yes. So that's his TV name, Alex Walker. I don't know if I'm permitted to give away his, his, uh, you, you can, it's Alex, Alex Gilliland, because I'm sure if you go to the Com media website, you can still find Alex Gilliland on there. Okay. Uh, so, so Alex, Alex Walker, Alex got a job in Lexington, Kentucky. And then at that point I was looking for gigs and I told him I'd love that job. And Alex very well knew what I was capable of and was following my work on Twitter. And, you know, I talked to Alex, pretty frequently. Uh, so he told his sports director and it was a pretty easy transition uh, from, from Binghamton to Greenville. Now I've been in Greenville two years, three months at this point. The pandemic has certainly changed some things. Uh, I didn't plan on, I signed a six month extension from my two year contract, typically in local sports, it's a two year contract. Two year deal, very interesting, yeah. Um, and I signed a six month extension in mid August just because the, the job market's not great right now because of the pandemic. And so I'm pretty content though in Greenville. The whole thing that I've told myself is patience because it's a grind. Local news is a grind, journalism is a grind. Uh, if you're just getting into this job to not understand that you're going to go to some small town to get the experience and be on your own, be away on holidays. I mean, I, I'm Jewish, so I get, I get Thanksgiving off. My boss takes the whole week, a week of Christmas off. So it works out that way. Uh, but just be prepared in this industry to not make a lot of money off the, off the bat, uh, to go to some small town, 
uh, and to work your tail off for two years to try to continue to climb the ladder. And that's what I'm doing. I'm just at peace with the fact that I think maybe I had aspirations to be in a bigger market at this point, but I'm just happy to have a job. Well, how, what are you? Are you 26? Or is that how old you are? 26? I'm 27. So that's 27. But you have two 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 year gigs in bigger markets. So logically, what's the next step for you? And if you're plotting out Tyler Feldman's career, I mean, logically, I could get a job in a top 50 television market. Illogically. I mean, well, of, of, a, of a market that's, that's top 50. So Buffalo is a prime example of a top 50 market. Greenville's market 100. There are 214 television markets in the country. Binghamton was market 163. So Greenville is a little bit higher, 100. And then my goal is just to keep climbing the ladder. Now, illogically speaking, SportsCenter ESPN calls tomorrow and they want to hire a white Jewish boy to anchor sports center. So, uh, but that's illogically, but you just got to have to trust the process. Trust for all the my process. Sixers, for all my Sixers I, fans. I, I, I've heard that before. A hundred's, a hundred's pretty cool. Um, uh, I, I think you've had a, the pandemic is giving you a neat opportunity to do news and news anchoring. Can you, you talk about that? And then I hate questions. Can you talk about that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Share how that opportunity came about, what you've learned, and then kind of the lesson about uh, even in pandemics, trying to expand your skill sets and taking advantage of opportunities. I think you answered the question for me, which is very astute of you. But terrific. Next question. <laughs> no, what I will say is, what I will say is, at the start of the pandemic, sports were totally wiped out, so I was kind of getting paid to do nothing. So. My news director asked me if I wanted to anchor our 12 p.m., our new newscast. And I said, sure. Uh, what a unique opportunity. And I was pretty upbeat about that, that chance. And so for three, four months during the pandemic, I'm now back to my normal sports duties for the most part. But for four months during the pandemic, I was anchoring our new newscast. And so I was getting experience preparing in a different way understanding what goes into a new uh, newscast as opposed to just a, a three minute sports cast. I was doing 30 minutes of news and I was filling in on our four o'clock show on our 5 p.m. show. And so just to have that trust that I had gained with our news director to be able to be put in that position, one, built up a lot of my own confidence that, yeah, I can do this. And two, showed me that in case in case the sports thing doesn't work out, a lot of times for a, a white guy in the local TV industry, news is an option to be in a city that you want to be in and work in. Um, I'm going to ask you about Joe Moorhead in a second. Um, but, you know, folks, I'm looking at you. I know folks are going like, wow, look at that beard. Look at that hair. You know, how, how important is that stuff on TV? The look matters. And I, there are some Penn Staters who are just starting out in the local industry and they ask me for advice and I tell them, you, you've got to look the part. Is that you've, got look, exactly. you've got to look the part. Shirt, tie. Like I'm, I'm repping, I'm repping this today because I'll let you all know, Portman said I could come in my jammies, but like little does he know, I don't really wear jammies. So like I made sure I put some clothes on for this because I feel like, okay. <laughs> um, but the look matters. So our station does No Shave November, which is why I have this beard. But it's gotten so many compliments that I, I don't know. I might keep it. So we'll see. Well, I, usually, I, I like, I hate neck beard. So uh, well, you good to know. I, I didn't know that, but I'm glad I, I trimmed the neck beard. Oh, no, it, look, it looks good. But yeah, that's thank important. You. Look, you know, looks the like look that. look matters. matters. Your, your persona matters. How you portray yourself matters. I'm talking about even as small of a detail as tying a good tie knot. Too many times I see talented broadcasters look disheveled, disheveled, whatever the word is. No, disheveled is a great word. Okay. And looking clean and having a suit that fits. And I think financially that becomes a, a problem, but you could find a good cheap suit or dress um, and I wear makeup when I'm on, I'm on TV because there are so many lights in the studio 
you've got to make sure my forehead is not reflecting all those lights. So it's, it's an anti-reflector basically. So, well, you, look, you know, speaking of disheveled, you look very sheveled. Uh, you broke, well, you. didn't you break uh, as a student journalist or journalist just uh, in your first job, you broke the Jomo coming to Penn State story. Was that you? I did. I did. How'd that come about? And, 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 and folks on this, you know, who Joe Moorhead was the yes. offensive coordinator at Penn State. Yes. I'm was, familiar. Is he, is he hireable? Is he, is he, is he hireable? Who, Joe? Yeah. Oh my gosh, he's hot. Oregon's, Oregon's uh, <laughs> taken off. Yeah, they are. So the Joe Moorhead stuff, not to give too much away, but I was out one Friday or Saturday night and I was getting drunk food at the Sheets. On, downtown uh, state college on pew on pew it's yeah across from pickles everyone knows no it's not a no it's not across from pickles or is it on the other street i haven't been in it's on, st- it's on pew everyone on this call knows okay that. all right cool thanks for correcting me making me look bad that's you know that's great poor man you can do that on your own okay anyway um it's honestly just from meeting friends i had a friend who said i'm friends with this one guy who played for Joe Moorhead and is telling me this information. And I was standing in line at his sheets. And instead of just letting that information go to the side, I kept pressing my buddy on it, like to text his friend. And then I, and then I confirmed it through that and tweeted the tweeted out that it was a done deal. Now I didn't have the specifics. I didn't have the Poorman article, which is telling me how much money he's making over the next three years and how it, all the inside details, but as a senior in college um, to get a scoop like that, at 1.30 in the morning on either a Friday or Saturday and um, be aware enough to confirm the story. I think I called a volleyball match the next day and was like still working on it to make sure it was all right before I went out with the correct information. But so that's how that came about. You got a schmuffin and a, a, a scoop. Didn't you get, did you get the Ronnie scoop then too? You got another one, right? Yeah, I did get the, the Ricky Ronnie scoop as offensive coordinator and now that you now that you bring that one up I don't know who scooped me on that story no I think you had it first that for that one too no I did I I don't remember how I how that story came about uh well you obviously do you're not revealing your sources I I think I tweeted it out and then totally blacked out but what that that happened when I was at WBNG and W Binghamton's like three hours from State College uh if those of you who aren't good geometry major or ge- ge- geography major. Yeah. That's supposed to be a joke. I just didn't do it that well. No. Um, anyway. Uh, so Penn state matters up in the Binghamton area. So we ran that story. Like I was there for that story and we, we posted it on the WBNG website and, and said, Hey, this is, this is the, this is what's happening. Uh, you're, you cover East Carolina on a, on a regular basis what's the difference between covering an east carolina and a penn state where do you want me to start at the beginning no not at the beginning in the middle well i'll just say this and i'm sure your students are smart enough to understand you're talking about a big 10 division one school with 31 programs correct 31 sports right yes so and then you're talking about an american athletic conference school with 16 programs who just had four teams cut because of COVID. Four? Immediately? Uh, Pretty soon after, swimming and diving, women's and men's tennis. Wow. So, so, yeah. I mean, financially speaking, it has been a tough go about during this pandemic for college sports programs across the country. Now, Penn State obviously has the benefit of making a little bit more money than ECU, but the differences are pretty drastic talking facilities, you're talking media coverage, you're talking ability to create relationships with SIDs and people within the Penn State community. There's just a lot more resources that Penn State has that ECU does not have. And that disparity has been eye-opening to me because I cover Binghamton Athletics uh, and they're in the American East. America East Conference. And so I don't, uh, for Penn State students who are journalists that are getting to cover all these big time 
Nittany Lions sports, even if it's remotely this semester in some capacity, realize that you have it a lot better as a journalist than journalists covering smaller schools and smaller towns with less resources? Two questions. Uh, if you're, you mentioned student journalists, but 80, and I, kids are tired of hearing about this, but 80% of the class wants to work in the sports industry. What do you do in the spring semester, this spring semester to further your movement towards that goal? And let's say fall returns somewhat to normal. Uh, what do you do to bust out to really make up for time lost on campus to get where you're at sitting in your folks uh, extra bedroom or garage in Pittsburgh? No, yes. to get to your second job in broadcasting. Yes, so, and I tell Penn Staters this all the time. You've got to get involved outside of the classroom. Like Foreman, what you do here with these, these speakers and when you bring people, I, I didn't even take your class yet. You're probably the one professor that I keep in touch with the most. And I yeah, think that's crazy. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's relationship building. That was from me meeting you through a Com Radio away football game trip. What, okay, what trip? Oh, we went to the one at Rutgers. Where the that guy was Rutgers. Oh, and, uh, so many great stories. I mean, we could talk another 30 minutes about that trip in general. We left the press box twice to get an extension cord. <laughs> I think I took a, I, I, I went to the bathroom in a stall next to Kevin Kugler, who was calling the game for Big Ten Network. I introduced myself while he was taking a piss. Uh, Did he extend his hand as well or not? No, he was, this was pre-COVID, but he was kind enough to keep his eyes straight and, and give me like, just to, hey, how's it going? Huh? But see, that's the thing, like, I don't really care. I, I'm not really uncomfortable ever. And I think if, if students and people are more comfortable Great. in situations where they're actually uncomfortable, you grow more as a person and you'd be surprised to see what happens in a positive manner because of those uncomfortable situations that you put yourself through, whether through work or asking someone a question or speaking up. I've just never been afraid to speak up. It's never been a, a problem for me. And I think that has helped me. That's um, great advice. That really is good advice. I feel like I strayed away from the question you asked. Well, no, I think you, you, you answered it. Okay. Um, you know, Plus, oh, to get involved. Oh, that's yeah, what I want to say. I, and, I, and, and folks on this call, they, they on this uh, Comcast, they they hear about getting involved. So tell me the one thing that when things return to normal in the fall, what would you, if you were at Penn State, what you would do um, besides going to Pickles at Cowboy Night at 10 o'clock, uh, what you would do for your career, the one thing? I, I would get involved either Com Radio, Onward State, the Collegian, go into a, or there's so many sports marketing opportunities with Penn State Athletics. Put yourself in a position where you're getting real life experience without the oversight of someone really telling you what you can and cannot do. Let the creative juices flow. Figure out what you like, what you don't like, because you won't figure out if you like broadcasting unless you try it. You won't figure out if you're a great writer or you like writing unless you try it. And there are so many different outlets at Penn State to get your hands and feet wet and see what you like and don't like and what you actually want to pursue. I mean, it's silly to let those resources just kind of sit back while you just attend class. Like no knock on your class, Foreman, but I, I never took it and I turned out just fine. Well, no, I'm, I'm, I, I learned from you. I, I've learned a ton about, about local broadcast news. Two questions. Um, folks need to have a big takeaway. What would you suggest there be, be their big takeaway um, beyond get involved? I would say enjoy the moment is one because unfortunately, and I, I feel for the students this semester, I mean, cross our fingers, but my Penn State experience, I don't know what it would have been like without sports and without the ability to safely meet people and communicate and grow in that regard. So big takeaways, enjoy the moment, try to find positives where there are negatives. The second is be patient. If, if you really want to do this industry and go into the sports industry, it's not necessarily the most talented that get the best jobs or that make it the farthest in the work, it's the ones who stick around the longest. 
and who build relationships and who are good to work with and who are nice people. It's a pretty competitive industry, but if you can be yourself, be nice, be patient and build relationships, you can make something of it. That's what we had Dave Brody from the NBA. That was kind of what he said. Uh, last one, this is Friday morning. Penn State plays at Michigan tomorrow. What's your prediction? I think for my own sanity, I might not even watch the game. And I won't be able to because I'll be driving back to Greenville. So that's a that's a plus. Maybe I'll listen to Steve Jones. God love. I mean, I, Portman, I read your article yesterday. It's 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 crazy. And you you threw in little little Russo piece that I had read uh, the week prior. So oh, uh, Russo. yeah, great guy. Love Ralph Russo. Um, uh, but about, so anyway, give me the prediction. We're finishing up. I don't know. I think. I think Harbaugh is on his way out. I don't know how he makes it through the, another down season. I think Franklin's got a little bit more wiggle room, but this is not the game that people expected to see between Penn State and Michigan this season. And you're picking. Uh, I, I'll, I'll say I'll say Michigan wins because it's at it's at the big house, right? Right. Yeah, it's a big empty house actually. Yeah, the big empty house. Yes. Right. So uh, um, I'll, I'll say Michigan pulls out the victory. Okay, here's a here's a nugget going into that game. James Franklin in the last six years is 49 and 22. The last six years, Jim Harbaugh is 49 and 21. So they're kind of the same person. Really? Just, yeah, really? Pretty, pretty stunning. Pretty, pretty stunning stat. All right, buddy. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll see you at Wegmans. Take care. All right. See you at Wegmans.